Cool. So I want to ask a question. Um, do we need distributed tracing? And the reason I'm asking that is it seems to me that distributed tracing is kind of a, a niche in the OpenSUSE community, right? It seems that everybody is using logs and metrics to analyze their systems, but tracing is kind of like on the side a little bit. All right, so I want to handle that question for a moment. And in my opinion, the answer is that depends on the questions we want to ask about, about our systems, All right? So yeah, I've already introduced myself, but um, I'm Johannes and here are my contact details. Uh, this is what I look like on GitHub. Um, and I work at Kinfolk, like I said, uh, we're a pretty small company. We are very active in the uh, open source community and very generally we do uh, very cool Linux and Kubernetes stuff. Um, so yeah, we're gonna talk about standards in this talk. So here is the obligatory XKCD comic on this topic. Uh, we'll get back to this one later. And yeah, here's what we'll cover. So I wanna discuss very briefly logs, metrics, and traces and a little bit the differences between them. Uh, we'll then uh, provide a very brief introduction to distributed tracing, why it's great, but also hard. Then we'll introduce uh, OpenTelemetry, the new open source standard for distributed tracing. We'll take a look into two of its tracing libraries, namely the Go and Python ones. Uh, we'll then demo instrumenting a distributed application using OpenTelemetry. And finally, if time allows, we'll discuss a little bit about the trickiest part or the magic behind uh, distributed tracing, which is context propagation. So um, this talk assumes you know what distributed tracing is and have at least some experience with it. However, just in case that's not the case, here it is in 30 seconds. So I instrument my code, uh, my services by importing some tracing library. Um, the library collects data somehow about what's going on inside my code. Um, that data gets shipped to a tracing backend and I get very fancy graphs that allows me to uh, get both low level as well as an end-to-end -end view of every request handled by my application, no matter how many services are, are involved in the request chain. Um, the last thing we need to know is that a span measures some unit of work within a service and that a trace is a collection of spans that have parent-child relationships between them. All right, um, logs, metrics, and traces. And by the way, when I say traces or tracing in this talk from now on, I'm talking about distributed tracing because there are also other types of tracing. So we mean distributed. Right. Uh, I'm gonna try and do this presentation without using the words pillars of observability. Let's see how this goes. It's very challenging. Um, logs, metrics, and traces all have trade-offs, right? Uh, for example, logs are easy to generate but pretty hard to deal with later. Uh, metrics are a bit harder to generate in the beginning, but then once you have them, it's very easy to store them um, and operate on them. And traces are hard to generate, okay-ish to process and store, and easy to query. However, I want to draw your attention to the rightmost column on the table. Um, logs are great if you want to know about events within a specific node, right? In events confined to a specific machine. Um, metrics allow you to get a high level overview of a node or of your entire service. But again, this is high level information. Uh, but only traces, as you can see, allow us to easily follow the lifetime of a specific request across your entire stack, right? And this is particularly useful um, in microservices um, environments or distributed applications. So in trying to figure out if tracing is useful to me, the question is, what's the question? So what questions do I want to ask about my systems? I can ask, why did this node crash? Uh, was this specific function on that node called? Is my service healthy? How much traffic are we currently handling? Uh, why was this specific request slow? Um, if I have some extra engineering budget, what is the best candidate for optimization across my stack? Um, or which services are involved? Uh, what, are, or what are the dependencies, if you will, uh, for handling a specific request? So we can see that among logs, metrics, and traces, each has its own area of specialty, right? And questions like the bottom three are very hard to answer in a distributed environment without distributed tracing. So things like, why was this specific request slow? What's the slowest link in the request chain, for example? Or um, which services are involved in handling that request? So if you find yourself asking these sort of questions a lot, then you may very well benefit from distributed tracing. 
um, because distributed tracing uh, allows you to get both a low level and an end-to-end -end information uh, about in individual requests. And that's, um, as far as I know, unique to distributed tracing. You cannot get this information otherwise. So this begs the question, why not trace everything all the time, right? At the very least, in some cases, you will be able to get uh, useful information that you cannot get, cannot get from your uh, logs or metrics. So this is why. Uh, up until recently, saying that it's hard to generate traces used to be a very big understatement. Let's see why. Uh, first of all, it's a lot of work. Uh, instrumentation usually requires code changes. Um, and it is typically hard to justify reducing your team's velocity just to enable tracing. And it's even harder uh, to try and reduce another team's velocity because you want tracing, right? And the Justin team might not be um, uh, interested in tracing at all, but if their service, the other team's service is in your request chain, then you are affected by it as well if they refuse to instrument the service for some reason or they just don't have uh, the, the resources for this at the moment. Um, and this leads to the next point, you can't have instrumentation holes, right? So at the very least, even if you don't care about tracing, you must propagate context across the request's path in order for tracing to even work, to be even useful. Uh, second, we cannot vendor lock, right? So vendor locking is, um, it, it's never nice. Nobody likes to feel they're married to their vendors uh, in general, but with tracing, it's particularly painful because vendor locking, if the vendor raises prices, changes their standards, whatever, then you're gonna have to re-instrument your entire code base. And this is, uh, it's a no-go, it, it, it's a non-starter, right? Um, Opsus libraries must remain, neut remain neutral. So um, you probably wouldn't use an Opsus library that says in order to use that library, you must open, uh, I don't know, a new Relic account, right? Doesn't make a lot of sense. And on the other hand, an open source maintainer cannot maintain support for all the uh, monitoring vendors out there in order to make the library traceable, right? Because it's a lot of work and sometimes there are proprietary protocols involved, et cetera. So yeah, that's another challenge. And lastly, some people go as far as claiming that distributed tracing in its very nature stands in contrast, in contrast with uh, microservices architecture, which is kind of weird because distributed tracing was introduced in order to solve some problems with the microservices architecture, right? So if you, uh, like me, are a Peter Bergen follower, you may have seen these tweets recently. Uh, he's saying the following briefly, microservices architecture is intended to maximize a team's velocity and independence above everything else. Requiring everybody to use the same technology contradicts this idea. Tracing requires everybody to use a similar technology, therefore tracing doesn't go well with microservices. So I think he might have exaggerated a little bit to, to prove the point there, um, but the point is still valid, right? Um, does, it, does this mean we cannot trace microservices? In my opinion, not exactly, but I do think that Peter is right um, in that you need a very delicate balance between freedom and uniformity in order to make distributed tracing work. Now combine the previous points. Uh, with the fact that we have multiple everything, right? We have multiple microservices, possibly written in multiple languages. Um, the services communicate in a bunch of ways, HTTP, gRPC, messaging. Uh, there are multiple tracing backends, both open source ones like Jaeger and Zipkin, and commercial ones like Datadog, New Relic, Lightstep, Dynatrace, AppDynamics, Stackdriver, and the list goes on. So how do you make all this work together? Is there a solution which could make tracing easy? Well, hopefully. And I think the answer is standards. So I hope that I was able to convince you by now that lack of standards is especially costly for distributed tracing. It can be, can be problematic in general, but with tracing, it's kind of mandatory to have a standard. Remember this. So at some point, the options community figured we needed a standard for distributed tracing because without a standard, distributed tracing becomes impractical. And that's what we did. A new standard has emerged, but we didn't stop there. It went so well that we created another standard. So we won't be discussing these two due to lack of time, but it's enough to know that for a while now, users had to decide whether they want to instrument their code using open tracing or open census, which kind of defeats the purpose of a standard, right? Because yeah, you need one. <laughs> the good news, on May last year, the open tracing and open census projects announced that they are uh, uniting behind a new front, uh, single new open source standard for distributed tracing, and that is open telemetry. Um, open telemetry is the next major version of both open tracing and open census. Uh, 
Now, um, the old projects, both of them are going to be discontinued once uh, OpenTelemetry becomes GA. Um, this is a very unique, in my opinion, a very unique real community effort uh, because it is a product of collaboration of multiple companies that are often direct competitors. So it's pretty rare to see this kind of collaboration, uh, even in the open source community. Um, the project itself is a spec and a set of libraries for multiple programming languages, all the common languages nowadays, or almost all of them. Um, the project is an API and an implementation. And the reason I'm emphasizing that is that previous standards, for example, open tracing, uh, did not include implementation. So it was just a very generic API. And then the API itself is not useful. You cannot do anything with it. You need to write your own implementation or, I don't know, the standard was not opinionated about how to in implement tracing. And in retrospect, this was most likely a mistake. Open telemetry supports both tracing and metric collection, uh, just standard metrics for Prometheus format or whatever. Uh, but in this talk, we're gonna focus solely on tracing. Here is the high level architecture of, of uh, open telemetry. There is a specification, a spec, like we said, which defines a very, very generically the standard way to do distributed tracing. And the spec is language agnostic, vendor agnostic, um, not necessarily protocol agnostic, but uh, yeah, there is, there is work around creating a standard wire protocol for open telemetry. Um, and each library defines an API. Uh, sorry, yep, there's the API. And um, the API follows a specification and implements it uh, in the canonical way of that specific language. So in a Go kind of way or in a Python kind of way, in a way that is uh, empathic to that, to that uh, language's design. Um, and the API can be used without an implementation, which is a really important thing. So if I'm importing, for example, an open source library, a third party library that happens to be instrumented with open telemetry, but I don't care about tracing, then I can still use that library and my code will still comply even if I don't plug in an implementation to the API, right? So this is sort of a small router within the API package uh, where I can decide to plug in an implementation or if I don't do anything, uh, the default no op implementation will be used, which means everything will work just without producing trace data. Cool, and then we've got an SDK or at least one SDK. An SDK is a ready to use implementation of the API. We have one in every uh, language library. And the SDK takes care of the actual span creation and things like context propagation and sampling. Um, alternative implementations are supported. So if you want to write your own and you have a lot of free time on your hands, um, you can do that. And lastly, we have exporters. Uh, exporters are responsible for delivering tracing data to the tracing backends. Um, some of them are open source ones, some of them are proprietary ones, uh, and they are per backend. So we have, for example, a Jaeger exporter for each library or um, I don't know, a stack driver exporter or a light sub exporter, et cetera. Um, the last thing I want to mention is the bridges. Uh, bridges. Bridges aren't part of the open telemetry architecture. They don't show up in this diagram, but they're important nonetheless because um, they allow a very easy transition from open trans tracing and open census, the old standards, to open telemetry. So if, for example, your entire code base is already instrumented using open tracing, uh, or using open census, you can use the equivalent bridge to start producing open telemetry spans uh, and tracing data without having to touch your code almost at all. This design uh, gives us a very nice separation of concerns. So as a library, de library developer, you depend only on the API. You don't care uh, about which implementation is used by the end user. And, and in fact, you cannot even know which implementation the user will choose, right? Now, as an application developer or an end uh, user, so to speak, you instrument your code using the API and you choose an implementation and plug it in while initializing your services somewhere in main function or in it or I don't know what. And as a monitoring vendor, you maintain just your own exporter. This is your only responsibility, uh, which makes a lot of sense because there are, again, many proprietary things, especially in the commercial um, side of the monitoring vendors. Now, the, this design is also empathic to user code. So uh, as a user, for example, uh, I may want to use uh, an instrumented library, but I don't care about tracing. So as we said, uh, the no op implementation uh, will work by default. My code will still compile even if I don't enable the, uh, if I don't press the enable tracing button. Uh, my code should never be broken by instrumentation. Uh, like we said, this is a little bit uh, repeating the previous point. Um, and performance impact is kept to a minimal. So the, the spec and the library implementation guidelines 
um, dictate things like try not to block uh, unless it's absolutely required, right? So uh, the worst thing that we can do when instrumenting code in order to monitor its health is that we destroy the health of the code because of the monitoring, right? Uh, if the service crashes because of the tracing library, this is uh, pretty bad. Uh, and lastly, we transmit tracing data asynchronously to the tracing backend so that we don't wait on a uh, slow uh, network retry or whatever and then halt the code until that completes. Uh, the project is currently in beta. It is planned to be GA on the second half of this year, hopefully. And we currently have libraries for Go, Python, Java, C++, Rust, PHP, Ruby, .NET, JavaScript, and Erlang. Uh, and we should expect more languages to appear later on. Uh, the pro project is already useful today. I mean, you can already uh, produce useful tracing data with it, as we will demonstrate in a bit. Here's a status of the Go library. Uh, so the latest release, which was released uh, yesterday while I was edit doing final edits to my slides, uh, is 0.4.2, uh, still in beta. And we have an API and SDK for both tracing and metrics. We have context propagation, which we'll discuss in a bit. And we have a bunch of exporters for Jaeger, Zipkin, Prometheus, and maybe a little more. Um, and we have the open tracing bridge for Go. And actually, we have almost an identical set uh, for the Python library, funnily enough. Um, the version is a little different because they, they're versioned independently, but yeah, we have more or less the same contents uh, for the Python library as well. Enough background, let's look at some code. So how do I instrument my services? This is what it looks like for Go. Uh, so instrumenting the code is fairly simple. Uh, I can start a spam by creating, uh, but by calling tracer.start. Um, and then I have to pass to start my context, the context object that I'm most likely uh, uh, received when creating an HTTP request or a gRPC request. Uh, we'll talk about context in a bit. And then I can defer span.end so that when my handler returns, um, the span will finish automatically. So pretty nice and very like go, idiomatic go. Uh, I can also use the, um, uh, this pattern, which is kind of a decorator-like pattern where I basically wrap my code uh, using the withspan function, and then when my code returns, the trace automatically ends. I can enrich my code uh, by adding an event, uh, logging, uh, uh, logging events on the span. Um, I'm sorry, I can enrich, yeah, enrich my traces on my code by logging events, so something happened, and then I can log it. I can set um, attributes, which are key value, uh, pairs as tags on my span so that, so that I can slice and dice them later in my backend. And the last thing that I need to know about instrumenting Go code, and this is specifically for the Go library, is um, I need to know about the inject and extract methods. We'll talk about uh, distributed concept, context propagation in a bit, but for now we can treat them as magic that we uh, just need to, um, need to include in our, in our instrumentation. So whenever I'm a client, before I'm submitting a request to the downstream service, I'm gonna use the inject method. Um, and then when I'm, whenever I'm a server, when I'm accepting a request from a client, I have to use the extract method in order for tracing to work. This is basically distributing context. Um, across the network. And as you can see, this is protocol specific. So in this example, this is uh, using the gRPC part of the uh, propagation library. Okay, gRPC trace, and we have also HTTP trace or whatever. Uh, in Python, things will look a little more minimalist. Uh, this is how you create a span. Tracer.start is current span, as span, and then we have a context manager here. Um, so the moment this uh, returns, the width automatically closes the span. I can do stuff. Um, this is my workload here, and then I can add events, so sim similarly to the um, Go library, and then I can set an attribute um, in order to tag my spam. Uh, context propagation here is handled for us by the library, so as you can see, I don't need to uh, deal with inject or extract in Python, which is pretty neat. Um, now that we know all this, let's look at OpenTelemetry in action. We'll demo this with a very useful distributed application. Uh, it's a fake job title generator. I personally really like fake job titles like executive marketing coordinator or I don't know what. So uh, I created a service that generates uh, random ones for you. Uh, we have a front end here uh, that is written in Go. Um, it receives HTTP requests from clients. And we have three backend services um, that are um, a gRPC servers. And the front end sends requests to the, to the uh, backend services over gRPC. 
uh, one of the services written in Python, uh, just so we have some diversity. Um, and if you see our own job title on the screen during this demo, this is a coincidence. So, We have a Docker Compose here that basically wires all these services together. Junior Whiskey Manager, regional CAD coordinator, corporate coffee engineer. You got the picture. Executive engineering tamer. All right, and this is Jaeger. This is my tracing backend. Um, let's see what it looks like. I have a bunch of traces here. Um, so yeah, here is my root span. Um, the front end service handled the request called a bunch of um, uh, backend services. And yeah. I can say that, for example, my seniority service, which is like the first part of the title here, is responsible for this part, um, shows, for example, assistant in this case. And let's see what this looks like at the code level. So this is my front end service. Um, you can look at the main function. There is a bunch of wiring information here. I'm gonna skip that and focus just on the important parts. Uh, somewhere at the beginning of my main function, I'm gonna initialize my tracing. I'm just basically calling this helper function here in the trace provider. And if I jump to it, this is some boilerplate code. I'm choosing my uh, exporter, which is gonna be Jaeger in this case. I'm wiring uh, things to Jaeger, um, registering the tracer as a global tracer. This is not too interesting. I'm choosing an SDK, this is interesting. I'm choosing just a, a default SDK here, but I could have chosen a different one uh, or default implementation. Um, and yeah, and now once I call that, I can instantiate a tracer, TR. And then I can call uh, tr.start in order to create spans, which is exactly what I'm doing in my HTTP handler down here. So this is where we create our span as soon as possible within the handler. We do tr.start tr um, and then we give it a name, serve HTTP request, and then we defer span.end. And then later on, as we saw on the tracer backend, um, we are setting attributes um, and logging stuff. So here, for example, we're saying this is a slow request. Uh, doesn't matter, I created a slow handler in order to demonstrate what a slow trace looks like because in tracing when everything uh, works as expected, the trace is kind of boring. Um, and yeah, down below we're logging the response that we got. So here, gener generating response. And this is the compiled answer that we got from our backend services and here, in case we got an error from one of the backend services, we're gonna log it and then set the trace, uh, the status of the trace to errored. Um, yeah, we can show what that looks like here. So if we generate slow request, chief dolphin researcher. <laughs> yeah, some of these are not very smart. Um, so this is a slow request. You can see that it took more than 500 milliseconds. The previous ones were pretty quick. Um, and yeah, now we can see that the calls to the backend services are sequential rather than parallel. And um, let's generate an error. So this is like an unreliable handler, the last one. So sometimes it will error. Okay, it errored on the first attempt. Errored on the first attempt. Um, and yeah, sure enough, here it is. And we can see that the field service had some random error. Let's check what happened. Yeah, this is what it had, random error. Uh, of course, in the real world, we'll have more intelli intelligent text here. Um, and because of that error, the front end service error as well. Yeah, getting field, unknown error. All right, uh, this was the front end service. Let's look at one of the backend services. Uh, so for example, the seniority service, 
same deal, any trace provider um, here in main, I'm not gonna repeat that, it's the same code. However, here we have a problem, okay? This is gRPC service. So basically my handler is here. And as you can see in gRPC, I don't have access to the request object, to the HTTP request, because this part is abstracted away from me by the library. So the only thing, the, the only thing I can do is basically ask the tracer, get me the current span. But the question is, what current span? The span was created, hopefully, when the request got into the server, but I don't see it every, uh, anywhere here. The only, the only thing I see is that I'm getting the current span is, and then I'm logging things on it uh, and tagging it, et cetera. So fortunately, the gRPC library uh, provides us kind of a hook, uh, which can allow us to define a handler that is executed every time a request is accepted by the gRPC service. Um, and there we have access to the request. There we're actually creating the span. So I'm gonna show this. Uh, here, when initializing the server, I'm defining a uni unary server interceptor, that's what it's called, and it's here in my tracing package on the side. And here in this function, first of all, I can see that since I am a server, I'm responding to requests, then the first thing I do is extract possible context information that I got from upstream. And then I can see here that I'm instantiating my tracer and creating the spam here. Now, even though I created the spam here in this function, it is available to me here because I can basically ask my global tracer object to tell me what the current span in memory is right now. Lastly, let's look at our Python service, which is the same thing just in Python. This was the second from the three. So very thin main function, we're calling serve. Um, here we're defining the interceptor, very similar principle to the Go service. And here there is some open telemetry magic, by the way, so I don't need to worry about inject and extract. The moment I call that, I will get uh, a span. A span will automatically be created for me for every request uh, that comes to, that, in, that is incoming to my server. And then what I can do here in my implementation, um, I can get the current span, right? And then log things to it. Cool. Um, let's see if there is anything we missed in this little demo. No, I think that was it. Um, yeah, let's move on. Well, see if I managed to get the presentation back to work. All right. Okay, um, in this part, last part, I wanna demystify a bit of the magic behind uh, distributed tracing, namely context propagation. So distributed tracing relies heavily on a pattern uh, with, with this name, um, but first we need to define what context is. So context is request scoped data. That can be anything. It can be a request or transaction ID, uh, it can be authentication information, anything that is propagated across, across a chain of functions or microservices. Now, um, we need context propagation in distributed tracing in order to do span correlation. So at the very least, we need to include trace ID and span ID with every request that we transfer on the wire. And also, um, we need to make this information available uh, for every function that handles part of our workload within a process. So we have two types of context propagation. We have in-process uh, propagation and distributed. Um, this is what in-process -pro context propagation looks like. Uh, imagine that the user instruments their code um, using um, open telemetry, and then they're calling some third-party library, library one that do something. And then that library needs to also uh, create a span because luckily enough, it's also instrumented using open telemetry. But the span that the third-party library here creates needs to be a child of this span. So the library needs to know what's the current span uh, right now in my tracer, uh, which is a problem. I mean, how do you do that, right? Imagine that you're imp implementing this library here and you need a way to figure out the current span in the user uh, application. So yeah, and same thing for the next library, of course, uh, in the call chain. So um, in-process context propagation is used among functions or Go routines within a service. 
in the case of Go, it's Go routines. In the case of, case of Python, it could be function calls, possibly in different threads. Um, and this means that implementation has to be thread safe. So there are two main approaches to solving that, uh, implicit and explicit. In the implicit uh, in-memory propagation, we use th things like thread local storage or global variables. Um, each of these techniques has its own problems. Uh, none of them is perfect, but um, yeah, sometimes it's better to do this than the explicit uh, way. Uh, the explicit way, you pass the context information as an argument to your functions, which is a problem because every function in your function call needs to have a context argument. Uh, and if you don't have that already, then you might need to change all of your fun function signatures, right? Um, luckily enough, um, the Go uh, implementation ha uses the context standard library package. So chance chances are you're already uh, you already have the first argument in your functions uh, as the context uh, argument. So, for example, if you're using the standard HTTP library, um, Go HTTP library, then you already get the context. Uh, and it's the same for gRPC and probably many other languages. Now, Python uses something called context bars. We don't have time to cover that, unfortunately. Um, but um, yeah, it's pretty similar to thread local storage where uh, basically every thread gets kind of its own instance of a variable and then they don't interfere. Um, this is what the in-process context propagation implementation looks like in Go. This is actually the entire implementation. Uh, it's really funny that it fits in one slide because the Python one is way more complicated and lengthy. Uh, but yeah, we have two functions. We can set the current span magically in the context and we can get the current span from the context and this works pretty well. Um, this, by the way, use, utilizes the context dot with value and value methods. Uh, people normally use context in order to um, cancel requests uh, across a uh, uh, call stack in kind of a cascading way. So, so if the, if the uh, main request is canceled, then all the subsequent child requests are also canceled. But yeah, um, this uh, functionality of storing and retrieving values from a context is a pretty neat feature that is used. Yeah, like I said, we're not gonna cover the, the uh, Python implementation, but I encourage uh, you folks to um, see how this problem is solved. In the Python library, everything is in the open and open source, of course. And finally, let's uh, briefly discuss distributed con context propagation. So we already saw that we have HTTP trace or gRPC trace dot inject and dot extract. So imagine that service A is talking to service B over HTTP and service B is talking to service C over gRPC, all right? So in this case, what needs to happen? Service A is a client, so it needs to inject, and it's gonna inject the context information on the wire, as in this case, an HTTP header, before sending the packet, the HTTP request, to service B. Then service B in turn is gonna extract this information um, and then generate the gRPC request downstream to service C, but this time it's gonna generate uh, or inject context information in gRPC, which possibly uses a different format, right? In this case, this is something called gRPC metadata, which is eventually also an HTTP header, but yeah. So again, the um, distributed context propagation happens on the wire, and this is why it's protocol specific. So for example, if we use the message queue, messaging queue, um, or bus or whatever, in order to communicate between these services, then yeah, we would have to somehow use that queue in order to transfer the context information, right? Um, I still consider myself a network guy, even though I haven't um, been doing networking for a pretty long time now, but uh, yeah, I, here is a Wireshark screenshot just to prove that uh, when you do an inject, then you can see the trace information included on the wire. Uh, this is a gRPC packet that I captured from service A to service B in this case from two of our services. Um, and here we can have the trace ID and the span ID encoded as an HTTP header. Uh, let's wrap things up. So tracing is tricky, but in my opinion, may well be worth it. Uh, it really depends on your business case. Um, for some types of distributed application, it's absolutely mandatory to have uh, distributed tracing. In other cases, you might get better information from traditional logging and metrics. Um, it's much easier than before to use tracing nowadays, thanks to open telemetry, um, because hopefully you'll never have to reinstrument your entire code base uh, because we have thankfully one standard, standard finally. And thanks to a pretty neat feature called auto instrumentation, you may not even have to instrument your code once. So this is still in the works as far as I know. Uh, but the idea is that if you're using one of the common standard uh, libraries like Flask or Python, for example, you don't have to instrument your code, you magically get spans uh, for free. 
no vendor locking, which is really important. So like we said, the open telemetry architecture encourages this nice separation of concerns. Libraries depend only on the API. Uh, users can swap implementations freely and vendors maintain their own experts. And lastly, in my opinion, open telemetry does strike a good balance between freedom and uni uni uniform uniformity, sorry, <clears throat> because it has simple APIs, uh, it supports um, arbitrary implementations, and it is maybe most importantly, a real community effort, right? So you have all the big names in monitoring uh, more or less behind this technology. So if you should standardize on something and you should if you want tracing, then open telemetry looks like your best bet. Uh, thanks everybody for listening. And I guess it's maybe a short time for questions. Yes, thank you. R very nice presentation. We do have a couple questions. One of them that came into the Q&A. What would the migration path be for systems that are already instrumented with the Open Tracing project? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so as you guys might remember, we have the Open Tracing bridge for many of the libraries. For example, if this is a Go service or a Python service, there, there already is an Open Tracing bridge. Um, the easiest way, if you want to use open telemetry right away and you don't want to re-instrument, then you can just start using the bridge. You'll have to modify a couple of init uh, lines somewhere in your main function, and that's it. And theoretically, everything should work, right? So basically, the bridge will use the open uh, tracing syntax in order to generate open telemetry tracing data, right? Um, so yeah, and later on, I mean, eventually things should converge to open telemetry. So over time, you can gradually refactor your code and basically replace um, your instrumentation with open telemetry instrumentation. It is technically possible as far as I know to combine. So if part of your stack uses open telemetry and another part uses open tracing, it should work. But as far as I know, there hasn't been a lot of interop uh, tests um, so far between the, uh, between the uh, different standards. And I know this is one of the steps that uh, is going to happen before the project becomes GA. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. So we have a couple questions that came from YouTube. Can open telemetry provide metrics on on an app? I'm assuming that is running in Kubernetes, like a report on performance, resources used, etc. Um, yes. So open telemetry, as far as I know, supports exporting metrics. Uh, I mean, it's language dependent, but I think that in the Python and Go library, uh, the Prometheus format format is supported. So you can basically use open telemetry in order to generate. Uh, Prometheus metrics as you would with the Prometheus library, for example. Um, and yeah, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> well, uh, well, let us know if it did not answer the question. Um, another question, uh, how is tracing data pushed to the tracing backend or how does it get there? Uh, so basically there is an exporter that uh, runs in the background and asynchronously transmits um, the tracing data. Uh, as far as I remember, it depends on the library. It has different operation modes, so it can batch spans or it can transmit them as soon as possible. Uh, this all affects performance, of course, but the main uh, design principles there is that we ship metrics to the tracing backend asynchronously. Uh, in my case, in this demo, I have uh, an instance of Jaeger running as a container wired together to the uh, other containers uh, um, that are uh, powering the application. But basically, the Jaeger service, or if you're using a commercial service like Lightstep, it could be somewhere over the internet, right? And then you need to define in your initialization code uh, the endpoint to which uh, to submit tracing data, and you might uh, want to enable encryption, etc. because, yeah, tracing data can be sensitive. Uh, but yeah, uh, very briefly, you, you wire your uh, application or your services to the tracing backend somewhere in the init code and usually data is trans transmitted asynchronously. So there is a separation between creating a span and then transmitting it because creating a span has to be non-blocking and transmit transmitting it has to be blocking because it's network based. Okay, um, and I'm gonna read this question. You might've answered it. Uh, when a span is opened, is that sent immediately to the tracing backend? Can unclosed spans be seen in Jaeger? Um, yes, so as far as I know, um, Jaeger supports partial, uh, well, it does support partial traces. I'm not sure about partial spans. I know that Sam back can support that, but I'm uh, no expert there. So uh, forgive me, I'm not sure. Um, a span is not transmitted as soon as it is created. Um, it is waiting to be closed and then it is transmitted to the backend because um, yeah, I think if you involve, I mean, we're measuring very short latencies here. So I think if you involve things like network latency within the, ta the span's lifetime, um, then yeah, yeah, I think, well, in theory, I guess you could have uh, transmitted two events separately, but as far as I know, uh, 
I, I'm not familiar at least with a, with a library feature that supports submitting just the start uh, time of a span. So the start time and end time are fields of the object that is called span. So I don't think you can just transmit one piece of information without the other. Okay. Uh, and we have one in the Q&A from Renee. Might have missed that, but how does this scale in high load applications? Yeah, this is a very good question. So um, I might have, yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't think you've missed that. Uh, I, I think I have just, uh, did, I haven't covered that in the uh, presentation. So basically there is an important uh, idea called sampling. Typically when you're using tracing and you're tracing every request, then in high load applications, it can be extremely resource intensive. Uh, more like, uh, I don't know, very verbose logging or something like that. Uh, so even if you're using everything like binary based and you're transmitting things asynchronously, just capturing the traces can be pretty uh, costly. So uh, sampling allows you to decide uh, on a certain logic according to which you're gonna do the tracing. So for example, you can, you can say, uh, I'm gonna sample every 10th request, so a percentage, or I'm gonna capture only interesting requests and it's up to you to define what interesting means. But then you can take a sampling decision at the, at the ingress to your um, stack and at the egress, right? So if you, for example, decide not to sample at the ingress, then you will not bother all the rest of the services in the request chain if that specific request happens to be unsampled. So I hope that helps. Sampling, that, that's, the, that's the answer. <laughs> 